Welcome to Heartland Vineyard's Message of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. To learn more about the vineyard, visit us at hvchurch.org. Yeah, well, good morning. If you guys don't know, my name is Boomer. Hi, Boomer. Hello. Hello. I'm on the teaching team here, and uh, I got a message to share with you guys today. Um, before we do anything, though, we just want to honor somebody that's uh, in our church here. Uh, Carol, Lori. There you are. Can you stand up, please? Thank you. All right. Uh, Carol's going on a mission trip to Puerto Vallarta. Did I say that well? Thank you. Um, she's going on a mission trip. She's going to work with a vineyard church down there for three months. Three months. That's awesome. Carol's got a good heart. She, she went through VLI just like I did. Uh, vineyard leadership. It's just Vineyard Institute now, though. But uh, she's got a heart for missions, and you've done this before, right, too. So what we want to do is, is anybody around here, guys, we just want to pray for her real quick. So if you guys are next to her, if you could lay a hand on her or just throw your hands out, we want to pray for her and honor her uh, for what she's doing for the Lord. So, God, I thank you so much for the heart that you've put in her to do the things that she does. God, just to take that time away uh, and reach out to some folks and share your message, to share your heart with them. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for her eagerness to dive in, to just study theology and understand you, and then take what she has and challenge her own worldview, just in another country, in a different culture. God, so I thank you for what you're going to do in her. Lord, I pray that you remind us to pray for her as she's gone as well. Um, we can't wait to hear about what you did through her when she gets back. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So give it up for her. That's awesome, guys. That was awesome. Um, before we do anything, before I do anything, you guys aren't really doing anything. <laughs> before I do anything, um, I want to share a couple books real quick, just because I, I might reference them in the teaching. But it's just a couple books that have been on my heart for several years since I started teaching, you know, and got involved in ministry about six, seven years ago. Uh, the first one is uh, Lead Like Jesus. That's the blue one. Um, uh, this is just a solid like resource for understanding how Jesus leads and how Jesus does stuff. We're going to talk about humility uh, in Jesus today and how that you know is lived out through our own lives. Um, so I wanted to throw that one at you. The other one is Dallas Willard's Spirit of the Disciplines. Uh, this is one of my favorite books in the world. Has anybody read this at all or opened it? Cool. <laughs> so anyways... It's awesome. Um, I have got like several copies of it, so if somebody even just wants to borrow it, let me know. But it talks about how Jesus lived a disciplined life, which I think is important for us, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. So I just threw those out there right away because so I stopped thinking about it, all right? Is that cool with you guys? So if you jot it down, whatever, if you guys read it, talk to me about it. I want to hear about it. But uh, where we've been for the past few weeks is understanding part of the character of Jesus as a humble king, the humble birth of Christmas, right? Jesus' birth, Jesus came. He wasn't, like, dressed in, uh, you know, like, robes and stuff as a king should be born, but Jesus is king, right? He wasn't born in a palace, like Rodney said. Um, there's some, you know, conversation stuff, whether he was actually, like, born in a stable or if it was just the lower level of a house. But, but anyways, he didn't have the royal birth that our king deserves, all right? Uh, he didn't come as, like, this conqueror, like, like Rodney said, like the world expected, Jesus came as just this baby, as a man, uh, a carpenter, living a humble life. Yet his small life of 33 years impacts all of us today. Um, so I want to start with a couple of quick quotes from one of my favorite theologians, uh, Rodney Wallace, if you guys have heard of him or read or seen any of his works. But he said right away, King, kings are born in palaces. Right? right away, Jesus did not fit the mold of what a king's birth should look like. The second one from Rodney, Jesus was not a conquering king like people expected. Yet he still came, conquered sin, conquered death, conquered our own lives if we had given him over to Jesus. Um, so can I pray real quick, guys, before we dive in? Good. So Lord, I thank you for your presence. God, I thank you for a room full of people that are eager to hear from you and not from me. So I ask that your voice is heard today, Lord. Let uh, your words, let scripture come alive with your character, uh, your humility, your call to a life greater than one that we could draw out and imagine for ourselves, Lord. So I pray right now, God, that your words speak through me. Um, I ask for your Holy Spirit to invade this place and open our ears up for your message. 
In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So Jesus' birth was a lowly birth. It wasn't this uh, huge spectacle inside of a palace with guards and maids and servants all coming around, all right? Uh, Jesus laid in a manger, which is a trough that animals ate at. Kings don't do that, all right? A lowly birth. Jesus was humbled from his very nature. Do you guys know um, what can a baby do for themselves, all right? So just to understand that God poured himself out into humanity as a man, as a baby. Have you guys seen a baby before? They're around every once in a while. I have one that is my roommate's right now. And he, he does nothing. He can't do anything for himself. The full, like, essence of humility we can grab by looking at a baby, you know? So for the creator of the universe, God that always is and always was, to uh, humble himself down to the essence of, like, a baby. Like, I, I've been trying to wrap myself uh, wrap my mind around that over the past few weeks, all right? So complete trust in another person, right? Like to even eat. To be, you know, like I try to grab, he's only, Judah's only four months old, but I try to like grab his hands around the bottle so he feeds himself. It works for like two seconds. If it wasn't for anybody else, he would starve himself. He wouldn't even live. A baby is completely trusting. And this is how Jesus came to us, all right? But at the same time as he comes to us as a baby, how many of you have had, like, a dark point in your life? Anybody? Cool. So you guys have had, you guys have really been rocking and rolling for years. I know it's first service, but everybody has had some piece of darkness that they've lived through, they may be living through, the loss of somebody that they loved, physical ailments, sickness, um, addiction, uh, mental illness, um, just a really bad situation with finances. Everybody has found themselves at some kind of low point. All right? So I understand that Jesus came to earth as a baby, but at the same time, he came to earth as somebody to stand next to people at that low point. That part where you're completely alone, where you've given up on everything. At that moment of Jesus' birth, a man now could stand next to you. A physical presence, a person could look you in the eyes. Have you guys ever looked in the eyes of your own children and just seen like a light and a, and a trust? and uh, a glow or like a joy, Jesus put himself in a place where he could look at people directly in the eye. Now, you and I weren't alive at that time, but imagine somebody was there at that time where they could look Jesus right in the eyes. Like, imagine our own life if I could look God right in the eyes, knowing that he knows everything that I have ever done and that I have thought and that I've been through. Jesus was a man at a point where he could do that face to face with somebody. That's kind of a side note, but I think about that. In your own quiet time, just imagine that moment, those 30 years where somebody could look God face to face, eye to eye, knowing that he knows everything yet still loves you. It doesn't really have a lot to do with humility, but it's just something for us to challenge us to understand about Christmas. Um, but to get to humility, okay? So understanding that Jesus was a humble king, he lived a humble life, he wasn't rich with Worldly riches, like we tend to understand, he didn't have a pa palace or a castle. If I was Jesus, I would have at least given myself a castle, but he did not do that. He lived a humble life uh, as a carpenter, um, but then he still came to conquer so much. So for us to understand Jesus' humility, there's three real things that I think that we need to get about Jesus' life, and this is what we're going to spend our time on right now. The first is that for Jesus as a humble king, what was important to him was spiritual discipline. I have it right up there. Just in case you don't know what those words look like on paper, spiritual discipline is written right behind you, all right? That book, Spirit of the Disciplines, talks about spiritual discipline, all right? So what do I mean by spiritual discipline? Have any of you taken some time alone just to pray and talk to God? Many of you. A second in the car. I'm going to take some time, and I'm just going to speak to God. Technically, that's a practice. That's a spiritual discipline. You're putting time away and saying, I'm going to give this to the Lord right now in order to hear from him, in order to change something in my core, in my own spirit, all right? Um, my wife and I, we practice tithing, and we've talked before about finances, um, about how there's not a law coming and saying, hey, cut off 10% of what you have and give it to the church. My wife and I practice that as a spiritual discipline for ourselves. It's something that we choose to do. The Lord isn't making me do anything. We choose to do it because we see a positive effect in our own lives. It changes something in our spirit, in our own lives. Uh, 
Jesus practiced spiritual discipline as a way to depend on the Father. It's, it's a, a movement that shows that he depended on God. Again, that's humility, okay, depending completely on somebody else, putting somebody before themselves. So Jesus, uh, he, he did a lot of things as far as spiritual discipline goes. One of my favorites, I guess, he rose early in the morning, Mark 1, 35. He rose very early in the morning while it was dark. He departed. He went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. This is a discipline that Jesus practiced. He got up before everybody else, went away, and had his time with God. This is something that I have incorporated into my own life over this past year. I'm not bragging about anything at all, but I have found out, wow, my life is way better when I choose to practice this. I'm going to keep doing it. There is no book saying, hey, you have to do this in order for God to love you, in order for you to get grace, in order to get forgiveness. I do it because I see a positive effect in my own life. Jesus did it because he was dependent on the Father. I do it because I'm dependent on Jesus. Okay? Uh, Matthew 4, 1 through 3. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. I have not done this. But... Uh, I have fasted before. I'm not saying I haven't fasted. My wife and I are talking about what we want to do for like the Lent season coming up. And again, this isn't law. Nobody's telling me to do this, all right? But this is a practice that I've done before and I've seen a positive effect. It gives me a season where I can just completely throw myself out there and say, God, I'm dependent on you because this is hard. It helps separate me from dependency on food for like enjoyment. Has anybody ever enjoyed a food before? Do you guys know those cake balls have like 12,000 calories in them or something like that? <laughs> and you know it takes literally 10 seconds just to grab one and eat it and you're done. And your daily caloric intake is over at that moment. <laughs> humbling. It is humbling. Uh, spiritual discipline for Jesus was a way for him to align his heart to a posture of worship of God. Uh, he was aligning his heart to a place of intimacy with God. And again, it's not about getting more grace from God or getting more forgiveness. It was about Jesus putting himself in a place where he goes, God, I depend on you, okay? So whatever it is, like that song, here's my heart, Lord. Like, Lord, here's my heart, here's my mind, here's my emotions. Uh, just please, God, like I really need you to take over today, okay? Like that is the essence of spiritual discipline. Spiritual discipline isn't law. Spiritual discipline isn't the old covenant, Spiritual discipline isn't the new covenant, all right? All it is is a real practice of intimacy between you and God. And this was important to Jesus, and it's modeled by Jesus in the scriptures, and he modeled it to his disciples. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, yeah, I need you guys just to stay here with me for a little bit. He knew that he was coming up to a challenging time of uh, being crucified. You know, Jesus knew his death was coming, and it was going to be hard. And I think it was Dan that talked about how he was sweating blood. Uh, but he knew that the hardest thing was coming. He needed to get away and pray and be alone with God. And he called his disciples into that too. He called them into that before they went and did ministry. Jesus went away and then came back and was with people. He knew that he had to have that discipline in him to get away and be alone with God. If Jesus needed it, who are we to think that we don't? The second thing. Really, really important to Jesus as a humble king that shows us how to live a humble life. He put others before himself, all right? Now, we can look around in our own life and try to figure out what that means. Does that mean I just hold the door open for people all the time <laughs> and I'm good? Like, I would like to think that that is it, but it is not, all right? So some discipline includes sacrifice. Part of putting others before myself is I'm sacrificing something in order for somebody else to have something. Uh, John 17, uh, Jesus said, and for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. Uh, that word consecrate is talking about a dedication. I'm dedicating myself to these people. My life is dedicated to these people in order that they have something better. This was important to Jesus. Um, in Mark, he healed that guy of leprosy, and then he said, now don't tell anybody about it. Now, if I was just out healing people, like left and right with these crazy diseases, you know, it seems like a scene where you would want to draw a crowd so everybody can see what's going on, all right? But Jesus knew that he wasn't going to be able to connect with people as well if everybody knew what he was doing. He knew that the crowd would start to hurt part of that intimacy that he had, where he could put other people before himself, where he could spend his time on other people and with other people, all right? His entire ministry was about us here today, all right? 
Like Jesus put himself, or he put us before himself back then, and then he's been doing that for 2,000 years. Otherwise, you guys really wouldn't even be here today, right? Um, and in that, humility, uh, this is from the Lead Like Jesus uh, book. Humility is realizing and emphasizing the importance of other people. So I think we miss something sometimes when we're serving or doing things for other people. The act itself is not what it's about. It's not about crossing off a list and saying, good, they were able to like, get their groceries inside because I helped them or whatever it is. Good, I helped them with their bill. The act itself is about realizing how important that life is. To look at somebody and not say, I feel sorry for you, so I need to do this. But to look at someone and go, you as a person are incredibly important. Jesus acknowledged that in people. He saw them and he looked them straight in the eye and said, you are important. It is important that you are healed because you have an important life to continue to live. None of these lives are throwaway lives. Jesus looks them right in the eye and said, you are important. You are loved. Um, This is from a a different book, but uh, it says, people with humility, they don't deny their power. They just recognize that it passes through them, not from them. That was that picture that Jesus had. And he gave it to his disciples that power is going to come from our Father in heaven through the Holy Spirit through to other people. Has anybody ever prayed for somebody and they were healed? Anybody? Okay. Do you know that you didn't do that? You did not. All right. Power came from you through you. And that's a humbling moment, too. Because deep down in our core, and I've prayed for someone and I've seen them healed. Deep in my core, I know that I'm not capable of that. But I saw something amazing. I was able to be a part of it. Because I humbled myself before the Lord and said, I can't do it. You have to come in and do it. So the third thing, relational intimacy. When Jesus told the, uh, the leper, the guy that was healed from leprosy, not to tell anybody, it was because he knew that he wouldn't be able to just walk into the towns now and hang out with people. He knew that he couldn't just walk in the door and sit down and have conversations. He knew that those crowds were going to come around, and that makes it difficult, Right? If you guys come into a room and there's only one person there, can you talk to them a little easier than if there's 100 people walking around trying to get at you? Like, it's different. Just imagine, like, rock concerts. Anybody ever been to a rock concert? Not first service. Sorry, guys. (laughs) Sorry. Second service, we'll talk about a rock concert. but. But just imagine all those people around. So, like, Jesus became a rock star at that point when he started healing people. They heard about him from town to town. They wanted to come and be around him. That makes it really, really challenging for him to be intimate with other people. That's why he wanted that to stay on the hush-hush. Like, he was so passionate about sitting and having a conversation with people. And honestly, guys, how challenging can that be for us some days? Dan and I have been talking about it. To be intentional with somebody, just to sit down and be with them and have a conversation. Yeah, you have a wife, kids, you know, best friends or whatever, but to reach out now and do that with somebody else, somebody that you don't even know, It's challenging. Our social circles have gotten so, so secluded from these outside worlds. It's tough. But Jesus modeled that. He modeled relational intimacy. He modeled that need, that understanding that other people needed a relationship with him, that other people needed to just have somebody that stood next to him in their broken, hurting place. Jesus knew that that was important. That was part of his humility, was understanding that he needed to put other people before himself. He needed to put, like, his weird relationship with his mom, you know, where she's like, hey, come. And he's like, my sisters and my brothers are here. These people need me too. I know that as a mom, you want to be with me, of course, but I need to be intimate and relational with these other people. That was so, so important, Jesus, in that short amount of time that he was alive. Um, the story of Mary and Martha. Do you guys know that story? It's in the Bible. The story of Mary and Martha, that, that story used to bug me sometimes just because I, I felt like I was seeing a, like, I think, felt like I was seeing like Jesus saying it was okay to be lazy at that moment. Uh, read it real quick. In Luke 10, um, they went on their way. Jesus entered a village. A woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet. Mary was sitting there and she was listening to his teaching, but Martha was distracted with much serving. She went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my, my sister has left me to serve all alone? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better portion, which will not be taken away from her. Jesus is showing us in that moment that relational intimacy is one of the highest forms 
of serving. That relational intimacy is probably one of the, the biggest things that we can do for somebody. And I have this idea sometimes that, hey, it's easier for me just to do the dishes or mow a lawn or it's easier for me to, you know, give you $10 or something like that. But to take a couple hours away and just sit and talk to somebody, a lot less, a lot less easy to do in my own experience. And Jesus models and shows us that that is so incredibly important. The idea that, yes, serving needs to happen, and there's going to be food, and there's going to be people over, and they need to get ready for this gathering. Jesus said, I understand that those things are important to you, but what's most important is that we're sitting here in each other's presence, all right? That heart posture that I'm doing, 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 and I'm doing so much for people, and I'm doing so much, and I do so many good things, that is fine. But if you're not sitting in it, being in conversation or in the presence of somebody else on a regular basis, you're really not doing anything for somebody. And I know that that might seem challenging, and I'm not you know, telling you what to do or, you know, talking down to anybody at all. But I think Jesus showed us how important this is, and we need to grasp that too. Amen? Amen. All right, so um, we've hung around uh, Philippians uh, 2 for the past few weeks. Uh, Paul is talking about, again, humility, putting other people before ourselves, all right? Jesus talked about that. He showed us that putting people before himself, being relational with them even when it's tough, all right? Healing people that other people wouldn't touch or talk to, putting other people before himself. Jesus models that humility over and over and over. Now, Paul in Philippians, and this is just uh, amazing to me because it shows the character of a king, not just a guy that's humble, not just a guy that serves, but a guy that serves and is also a king. Philippians 2, 3, um, I think I used a different translation that's up there, so I apologize, but um, Paul says, do nothing from selfish rivalry or empty conceit, but in humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, on surface value, it says, okay, good. I'm supposed to not be selfish, put other people for myself. Like, hey, you need a dollar. I've got three dollars. Here's a buck. Uh, there's more to this, which is exciting to me. So let's dive in. Now, when he says, but in humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Up there it says, count others more important. Uh, there is a word in the Greek, and the word is hegomai. I think I said it right. And the, this is a derivative of that word, and that word doesn't just imply to put people before you or serve or, you know, humble yourself before other people. The, the word implies that, but it also implies leadership. It implies like a bold stance of putting other people before yourself. So the, the kind of picture that I had this morning as I was praying was like, you know, hey, I opened the door for you, and so like, oh, you know, you know after you, like go through but I, I opened the door for my brother, and I said, come on, man, you're always going to be before me. You know, there's a bold stance of serving. So putting people before yourself and saying, listen, man, hey, we're going to get together. I need to sit down and hear what you have going on. There's a bold stance of serving other people. There's a bold stance of being intentional in other people's lives. Not just saying, hey, if you need something, you can have it, you know, before I get mine. No, it's saying, if you need something, come on, let's go and get it. I'm going to make sure you get what you need. I'm going to put, to put aside, you know, anything else I have going on to make sure you get what you need. Now, this word implies leadership. Now, Jesus is 100% leadership material. Now, the world might teach um, like a picture of management and leadership within our businesses, organizations, and government that is completely different than what Jesus models here in the Bible. And it's true. They, they absolutely do. What Jesus models is a way for us to be servant leaders, all right? So it's not just a, like, fact that I'm going out and I'm serving other people. I'm actually leading other people by the way that I serve them, all right? Now, if we look and see what Jesus did, did Jesus lead people? Did Jesus lead people? Yes, he absolutely did. He's still leading people, all right? He's still leading people 2,000 years after his birth, all right? Did Jesus serve people? Yes, he did. Was Jesus the essence of, like, what humility can possibly be? Yes, he is. Jesus is the perfect model for us to grasp of leadership. Now, some of you are like, I don't, I don't have a family. You know, I don't have, uh, you know, a place on my job where I'm really a leader. Every one of you have, like, this bubble of existence, whatever it is that God has challenged you now to lead. 
Now, in order for us to lead that existence, we have to understand humility. We have to understand Jesus' model of leading that existence. Does that make sense to you guys? All right. So humility isn't about lowliness, okay? Humility in its essence of what Jesus showed us is really about a powerful existence where we get to be leaders of our own lives by putting other people before ourselves. Now, I know for myself that I think I made a joke one time where I showed a picture of Wolverine and said that's what my New Year's resolution was going to be. You guys remember that? That idea where I write stuff down on paper and say, like, 2019 is the year, guys. Have you guys already started? Not yet? We still got a couple days? I'm going to work on myself this year. Here we go. It's boomer time, 2019. You guys have probably haven't said that one, but that idea that I want to turn and change my life and make something better out of what I have been, like, really is about putting other people before myself. It's really understanding how Jesus served and put other people before himself. It's really understanding how Jesus was humble, all right? Jesus understood the importance of other people. And I think that the picture we have is that, like, if I'm spending too much time focusing on myself, the truth is, is I'm probably messing it all up. If, if I'm looking at those that are around me and the needs and stuff that they have, I think what that does is that moves me out of the way and gives God a chance now to work on Boomer, all right? Because he knows way more about me than I do. Amen? Amen? All right? God knows where you've been, and he knows what's actually going to make you healthy. He knows what's actually going to make you strong. He knows what's actually going to benefit your relationships. And if I am living in this place where I've got to work, work, work just to get me better, just to get me better, I think we end up really just making a mess of the whole thing. I think that Jesus modeled that perfectly to us, all right? Now, I, I do see, like, some concern that, like, yeah, I need to make sure that I'm, you know, healthy, that I have food. You know, those things are real. Like, I'm not telling anybody just to, you know, live with this wild abandonment of what reality is at all, but to understand that there's people around you that Jesus has like strategically placed around you this coming year, all right? There's people placed around Jesus that he modeled, he ministered to, he served, he was relational with, he put before himself, all right? He didn't get to touch everybody. Like you and I didn't get to sit down with Jesus in the flesh, and I believe we will someday, but that impact of the people that were around him is still felt today. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this room. Amen, guys? Amen. So let's just, let's just go over where we were, okay? What was important to Jesus was spiritual discipline, all right? In order for the humble king to embrace who he was, he had to understand that he was dependent on the Father. He humbled himself before God. I only do what I see the Father doing. Uh, he put other people before himself, including his time, his energy, Jesus modeled that perfectly for us all. He gave his entire life for all of us, all right? Uh, I don't know of a greater form than completely giving yourself away, your life, the years that he had. He gave it away for all of us. And then relational intimacy, understanding that you have to be intentional on digging in with the people around you. And a lot of times that trumps some action that you can do for them. Amen. To go back to my favorite theologian, Rodney Wallace, as a worship team can come back up. Last week, Rodney said that God isn't interested in us following a lot of rules. So I hope that none of you got that from me today, that the Lord is, you know, I'm telling you that the Lord is telling you guys to do some stuff. I hope that you don't get that message. Um, spiritual disciplines are something that I run to willingly because I see the health in my own life and my family. Um, those people that live in my house are dependent on me, and I am not good at a lot of things. So spiritual discipline is the best way that I can serve them. Um, I, I like my alone time. I like... Um, I play this stupid baseball game on my phone, and my wife hates it so much. But when I get off work, there's a thought in my head that's like to just lay on the couch and play that baseball game. But I know that the best way to serve my family sometimes is just to be there and be present and to listen to how their day was and what they have to say. 
even though in my mind I'm thinking, I just worked, man. Like, I know that I have to put that thing in me that thinks I need something or deserve something. I have to put it beside and say, right now I have to give myself to my family, regardless of how exhausted I might be. Amen. It's not because the Lord tells me to do it. It's because I know that that's what's best for them. And in turn, it's what's best for me. So back to Rodney. Rodney said, God isn't interested in us following a lot of rules. He's interested in us following Jesus. So I know that I have to look at the life of Jesus. I have to break it down on paper for myself and for you guys and go, this is what was important to him. This has to be important to me. You guys all stand up. We're going to worship here, okay? You guys, close your eyes. I just want to pray over us as we enter back into intimacy with God. And understand that even what we're doing right now, this is a discipline. We're sacrificing an hour or whatever that is out of our Sunday and saying, I need a connection uh, with people. I'm humbling myself before that and saying, I need a connection with God. I'm humbling myself before the Lord and saying, I need to worship you and connect with you and give you praise for what you've done. So God, right now, I just thank you that you're showing us how to embrace your character as we go into a new year. Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you so, so much for everything that you have given. And I know that you look at me and you say, Boomer, you don't owe me anything. But you're changing me as I learn to understand who you are, Lord. You're changing me to want to give everything away. So God, I thank you that our debts are all paid in this room, Lord. But you want to challenge us to a lifestyle, of a commitment to something greater than ourselves. And in order for us to enter into that, we have to humble ourselves. We have to humble our, ourselves to, in our very, very core, in our person, we embrace the, the nature of a baby that says, I can't even feed myself. I need you, God. I can't even clothe myself. I need you, God. So come, Lord. Come, Lord, show us your character.